everyone. On behalf of the Community Design Center, Board of Directors and staff, I'd like to welcome you to the 16th Annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. As many of you know, I am Maria Fergiwelli, the Executive Director of the Community Design Center. And this year's theme is Building a Just Community. In 2015, the theme for the lecture series was Balancing the Scales, Equity by Design. This is where we first began to explore the intersection between placemaking and equity. We believe that the theme of this year's lecture series, Building a Just Community, can be a catalyst for much needed conversation and hopefully an inspiring actions that can be a positive impact for our community. All of our programs for 2021 will be supporting this theme. The Community Design Center of Rochester was founded in 2003 and is celebrating nearly two decades of service to the greater Rochester region. We promote design excellence and sustainability in the built environment through advocacy, education, and grassroots community engagement. I'd like to take this time to introduce you to our board members, Bill Price, Monica McCullough, Stephanie Annunziata, and Vanessa Villeneuve, our executive committee. On the lower row are Natalie Anderson, Eugenio Marlin, Howard Decker, and Tanya Zwalin. Really thank them for their continued guidance and support and the tremendous commitment they've made to the Community Design Center. I'd also like to take this time to recognize and thank the New York State Council on the Arts, uh, who has made our work possible throughout their generous, uh, throughout our existence with their generous support. Our circle of friend members are persons or businesses that have made a commitment of sustained support to our organization. We gratefully acknowledge their support. We extend an invitation to any of you who value the work of the Design Center to please join our circle. And now I'm pleased to say that we are so happy to have Home Leasing as our presenting sponsor once again. Uh, we're truly grateful for their commitment to the series and their generous support. And I'd like to thank our event sponsor, Heaven and Company. Thank you also for your continued support. With special thanks to our exclusive media sponsor, WXXI, and to the AIA Rochester for being our sponsor for our professional development credits. And we are grateful to all of our supporting sponsors and lecture series friends. Thank you also for your support. The series would not be possible without all of your support. So we're very, very grateful. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the unsung heroes that have made this series possible the Community Design Center staff, especially Monica Reifenstein, who is our Zoom wizard behind the scenes, and our lecture planning committee who work tirelessly throughout the year to plan the series, and of course, our board of directors. And this is just a reminder to please take the survey at the end of the presentation. Your feedback is, helping, uh, is helpful for us in planning all of our future programs. And so the following slides are for those individuals who would like to get professional development credits. This presentation is approved for APA and AICP professional development credits as noted, as well as AIA credits. If you wish to receive credits, uh, please note that Monica has posted in the chat how you can uh, how you can register for uh, the credits so that uh, she can be aware and follow up with you with any necessary documents. Here is the brief course description. And here are our learning objectives. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Sarah Bronin is a Mexican American architect, attorney, and policy maker specializing in property, land use, historic preservation, and climate change. She advises the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Sustainable Development Code, serves on the board of Latinos in Heritage Conservation, and leads Desegregate Connecticut. She holds an endowed chair at the University of Connecticut Law School 
and has served as a visiting professor at the Yale School of Architecture, the Sorbonne in Paris, and universities in Switzerland and Korea. She, has, she was educated at Yale Law School, Trustman Scholar, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and at the University of Texas. She is the author of the forthcoming book, Key to the City. And with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Um, and I'm beaming into you from Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, really grateful to be here. Thanks, Maria. I did have, before I started, and I have a presentation, but before I started, I thought I would um, ask you guys a couple of questions. And so if, if you guys could put up the poll, I just had two really quick questions. They are, do you did you participate in Rochester City Plan? And there should be another one in there somewhere. This will just give me a sense of who's in the room. All right, um, and then how about the second question? Do you live, work, uh, have another tie to Rochester or have no Rochester affiliation? So if you couldn't see the answers to the last question, uh, about two thirds hadn't participated in the, the city planning process. And here we have another set of answers. Uh, uh, just over half live or work in Rochester, and you could have picked multiple, so uh, that's why the percentages don't add up to 100. Uh, um, and about 10% have no Rochester affiliation. So again, that gives me a sense of, of what your, your tie is, um, and uh, perhaps uh, those of you who uh, uh, have a, a tie but don't live and work actively in Rochester, maybe you are, um, maybe you are, uh, and I'll just share this. Uh, there for those who can see that. Uh, welcome back to Rochester for those who have a tie. All right, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. The topic for today is um, zoning for equity. Let me just close the poll. And it, it, this fits, as Maria said, into your broader theme of lectures for this year. And I'm just gonna put my phone up so I check my time. And I'm, I'm really glad to be kicking it off with this conversation about zoning, because in my opinion, zoning, which is the local regulation of land use, uh, dictates really everything that can happen in our society uh, or in, in, in cities with zoning anyway. I'm going to talk a lot today about Hartford, so I thought I would give you uh, a sense of what the built environment of Hartford looks like, um, or the best of the greatest hits of our built environment in any case. Um, we have uh, a, a downtown uh, like Rochester does. Uh, unlike Rochester, we have a state capitol building, that's what you see on the left. We have a downtown baseball stadium. On the bottom left is some cast iron buildings and some high rises in the central business district. In addition, uh, like Rochester, and I'm mostly showing you these images to, to have you think about places uh, in your town that are really similar. The two the two cities, uh, you know, share a lot in common. I would I would guess. Um, we have uh, on the top left industrial buildings that are nestled into uh, neighborhoods uh, as they were. That's how they were developed with worker housing around them. Uh, you may have, if you've been to Hartford, you may recognize the Colt Building. Uh, historic buildings all over the city, uh, the bottom left, bottom right is what we call perfect sixes. We've also uh, been doing a lot or tried to do a lot here on bike and pedestrian issues, although we're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, we have a, a Connecticut fast track, which is a bus rapid transit system. Um, we uh, have lots of great parks, which I, I know Rochester does too. Uh, historic parks, we have on the top left Bushnell Park, which is the oldest public park in the country. The bottom left is uh, Elizabeth Park, which is the oldest municipal rose garden in the country. We have a riverfront that we uh, have tried to connect a little bit better to the city. And we do have some wild areas like the Park River. And so my question to you is, does any of that look familiar? My 
assumption or my, my basic uh, uh, overarching uh, assumption here in, in everything that I'm going to say today is that the story of Hartford is a lot like the story of Rochester. So, uh, you know, you could let me know in the Q&A whether you disagree, but I think, you know, what, 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 what I've read and, and seen about what you guys are doing is very similar to the process that Hartford uh, has undergone. <clears throat> and, and the things that I've looked at for Rochester and preparing for this lecture uh, include that city plan. And I was wondering how many people were familiar with it because I wanted to know how much detail to go into with these slides. Um, so in the city plan, there are a number of, of, of uh, really interesting uh, ideas. Um, this slide shows a, a part of the city plan that talks about the, pri the overarching priorities in the plan. So healthy living, equity, resilience, prosperity, and partnership. And even though today's conversation is about equity, I actually think that all three of these first, the first three items that I mentioned are really one and the same. The equity is about um, sustainability. It's about uh, health. It's, it's really interlinked. Unless you have a, a healthy, sustainable city, uh, you'll never have equity. So they're, again, to me, they're all interlinked. Of course, economic uh, inclusive economy is important too, but to me, these three are very, very much linked. And so with that, I'll turn to the question of zoning. So I want to talk brief. So I, I and you may have seen a, a, the paper that was linked uh, to the advertisement for this event. It's called Comprehensive Rezoning, and it's, and it's available on SSRN uh, for free download. It's it's our um, the law professors and social scientists uh, post their papers there. So in case you're looking for it, um, I, I talk about zoning in that paper and about Hartford zoning, in that, which I'll uh, be focusing on today. Uh, there, but but just for context, um, uh, rezonings or, or really comprehensive reviews of zoning codes are very very rare. Um, it, over the last or the preceding ten years, from the time I wrote that paper, there were only a couple of dozen cities of three hundred cities with populations of one hundred thousand or more that had comprehensively rezoned. Um, there are a handful of cities that meet that criteria that are currently undertaking a rezoning. Um, but it's really rare. Uh, New York City is another example of this. So the birthplace of zoning, 1916, uh, with the plan for rezoning the city of New York, um, it has not been comprehensively revised since 1961. Uh, you know, instead, that zoning code has been uh, has accreted over the years with these really uh, complicated uh, um, provisions and ideas that really get to uh, a, a zoning on a scale that we don't see, thankfully, in any other city. Um, but it, it's really gotten to the point where it really should be uh, should be reviewed. Rezoning, so rezoning really means changing a zoning code so that it's different than what it is uh, currently. A rezoning could be small, it could be um, uh, uh, just a few provisions, or it could be a comprehensive rezoning uh, as we did in Hartford. So why do communities rezone? There's lots of different reasons. Um, outdated laws, uh, trying to improve processes, trying to reorder growth patterns, trying to transform the city. There's, zoning uh, has so much control over what we do that it also has a lot of promise as to what we could do. Reading your documents, it seemed like Rochester uh, was a place that has aspirations for rezoning. And it actually, even though the way that the plan is written, it, it sort of piecemeals the, well, we'll rezone for this, we'll rezone for that. If you add them up together, what it looks like Rochester really wants to do is to do a, a, a whole scale uh, rezoning for the city. Uh, there's talk about a form-based code uh, there's certainly talk about environmental sustainability and there's talk about housing and changing housing. I'll spend the least amount of time on housing uh, uh, at, at, on the local level, but I'll talk about state uh, state level reforms uh, that, that might inform what you're doing. But I, I, I'm going to break up this uh, conversation into the form-based code, sustainability aspects, and housing and tell you what Hartford does in the hopes that it inspires you to, to pick up some of these concepts in Rochester. So again, um, the, the, the placemaking plan, which is one aspect of your overall city plan adopted in 2019, um, really highlights zoning and land use regulations <clears throat> as a mechanism to achieve the goals of the plan. All right, so with that said, Hartford rezoned in 2016. Uh, we adopted the zoning code after a 
a long process of community engagement, much like the engagement that you saw on your plan. Now, we did it in reverse in a way in that we were sort of driving the car while we were building it. Uh, we did planning and zoning all in one. Um, at, we, we didn't write a plan, but because the plan that we had was outdated, we really had to get uh, a much better sense uh, as to what people wanted through the process of the rezoning. Um, so we built the rezoning first um, and we have a new city plan uh, now, um, but, uh, but we didn't at the time that really guided the rezoning. The thing I like about your plan is that you have a lot of very specific things that are in the plan that speak to zoning that you can then take to zoning without having to do the kind of work that we did here. But either way, you have to do the work of community engagement. Um, in going through the zoning code, so I'm going to talk a lot about the, the or a little bit about the process here. We found some really interesting um, things in the code. For example, the uh, old use district. Uh, so every zoning code has a it has tables or um, explanations as to how different uses can occupy different districts. In Hartford, the use base district. Uh, provisions before we changed the code were 61 pages. Now they are three pages. So we really streamlined development uh, processes by making it much clearer as to what could be done. Uh, but this is an image that just reminds me to tell you that one of the things that we found in the old code was that rice factories were regulated differently than vermicelli factories. There's no rational basis for that whatsoever, but yet it was something that the old code did uh, I don't know why, maybe because somebody thought it was important to do, maybe there was a rice factory uh, lobby, um, I have no idea. But that's the kind of thing that you probably see in your code. Um, I'd encourage you to look at the rice factory section. Um, <laughs> the, um, the other thing that our code did, and one of our aims of the code was to cut down on the amount of public hearings uh, that, that uh, the city has. So going back to the public process, we put the emphasis in public process on the development of the rules. We wanted to get as many uses out of a public hearing um, as possible. And the reason for that is so we did not want future um, decision makers to have too much veto power or too much discretionary power over uses. Discretionary power over uses has a very negative effect on things like equitable housing development in particular. So when you see, you know, the next subsequent year and a half or so, the couple of years, lots of our meetings that were scheduled were canceled. I think that's a good thing, not just because, uh, you know, I was chair for seven years and have three kids and night meetings were not that great. Um, not just for my own personal schedule. It's actually good for processes to have public input on the very minute details uh, in the process of writing the regulations and letting staff go through the process of approving and negotiating with applicants. So that brings me to that first category of form-based codes. And again, this is something that you all have already thought about in your plan, which is very interesting uh, from my perspective. You looked a lot at different character, character architectural character um, of the community. And character is a very loaded word, if those of you in housing uh, the ho housing uh, know. Um, so you've, you've thought about this already. You've identified specific areas. Center City, Marina uh, uh, District, College Town Village District already have form-based codes, from what I understand. Um, but the reason for form-based codes and expanding those to really the whole city, uh, which Hartford did, um, is uh, there's a few of those. You have clear design guidelines. Because your city is a historic city like Hartford's, you have com more compatibility with the historic fabric. And again, I can't tell you how important it is for cities like Rochester and Hartford who have suffered population loss and desperately need the right kind of development to set out rules in advance that can then fast track development. And I call this as of right development. Uh, code of metrics was a consultant that helped us with um, with the chapter four, well, really the whole code, but primarily um, chapter four of the code was a huge contribution um, in categorizing our, our code. So uh, um, our code is, is online uh, at the Hartford Zoning Code, but it, it sets out in chapter four uh, two uh, charts that describe what types of buildings are allowed in what types of districts. And you can see if you can read the very top part of the chart, um, you know, downtown commercial, apartment building types, row buildings, house buildings. 
And in our code, this is actually our code. So we put pictures in our law, our legal document, showing images that satisfy certain building types. This is the downtown storefront. You can see that what it has in common with each other. It's between you know four to eight stories, sometimes higher. Uh, the storefront buildings always have windows uh, in that building type uh, on the ground floor. Uh, they, uh, they are built up to the street. Uh, th they usually have flat roofs. Another example of a building type, this is the most common building type in Hartford. It's called the house type B. Uh, and again, here you can see certain physical commonalities between this, these different uh, buildings. They have porches, they have, or stoops, they have pitched roofs. They're two and a half stories. This is showing you what our code says and requires. A form-based code sets out the kinds of things that you can do if you wanna build a certain building type. So for this building, again, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it says here between two and three stories, pitched roof, 75% um, of, of the front lot line must be covered by the building. Um, it has to be built up to a building line, which is a, a new urbanist uh, construct that's been incorporated into many form-based codes, but that provides a street face uh, for the entire building um, that, um, that, uh, that is common for the street. So form-based code is really an important part of, of Hartford's experience. We zoned the entire city to be form-based codes. And again, we use the form-based code to, to make more of our development as of right. At the same time, we heard during the consulting process that sustainability was an, a, a, a very important concern for our city. Hartford, by the way, is 15% uh, white. Um, it's a very low income city. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been here, it's, it's a wonderful city, um, but it has lots of challenges. And people really understand um, that many of those challenges, health challenges like asthma, uh, respiratory disease, obesity, are actually tied to the built environment. They're not going to tell you, you know, what the high level zoning policy is, but they can tell you, you know, when you're asking them, what do you like about your community? What do you not like? Everything that they tell you they don't like is something that can at least in part be addressed. Um, well, from a land, any land use issue that they uh, that they tell you talk about, uh, you know, can can often be addressed through zoning. When we looked at our zoning code, um, we we found a number of um, a, a, you know a number of themes or a number of, of subject areas within sustainability to focus on. So energy, food, green space, transportation, waste, and water. And by the way, I think the Q and A feature is for you guys if you have questions to go ahead and put those in the Q and A. Um, so please feel free to do that uh, so we can when we get to the moderated uh, portion. Um, in the area of energy, zoning codes have a big role to play. Well, first, overall, the way that whether or not they do, they allow for compact development uh, is is inherently an energy issue. Um, but they can also zoning codes can also allow or not allow for renewable energy. Our code allows renewable energy anywhere. Uh, zoning codes can uh, allow or require electric vehicle charging. In every new parking lot, we, re we require at least 3% of the spaces um, to be uh, to have electric vehicle charging stations. We also provide height bonuses in our downtown and transit-oriented development areas for, uh, for renewable energy and cogeneration combined heat and power. Nobody's used those yet because nobody's building skyscrapers beyond the, 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 the height limits downtown and in, in the TOD, by the way, but it's there. Um, food is another really important area, and, and that is an area that, that we heard more, uh, it, it surprised me how much we heard about food in our discussions. Um, so urban agriculture, that can include farmers markets, it can include beekeeping, um, uh, community gardens, uh, urban farming. That's something that, that was illegal in Hartford before we changed the zoning code, and we actually legalized in every district except for single uh, large urban farms, which we've allowed, but just not in, in every district. So hen keeping, beekeeping, all of that is, is, is allowed here. Uh, landscape. So our landscape plays a critical role in, in our, uh, really in our survival, um, as you know. Um, a tree canopy, cover. so what can zoning do about that? Zoning can dictate uh, the uh, tree canopy coverage for new developments. Um, it can, uh, as Hartford does, we provide bonuses for green roofs. Um, we also require, uh, as a development happens, that 
development within a single lot be biodiverse, we actually specify the, the kinds of trees that, that can be located. On the left, you see emerald ash borer coming to Hartford, which is a big problem uh, because many of our trees are ash trees, so we do not have that diversity here. Um, for transportation, um, so this is uh, really it, it, uh, a critical issue to the way cities develop. Uh, in the chapter of, uh, in our zoning code, we have a chapter on streets um, and we provide a Fitzgerald Halliday uh, is the consultant that, that worked on that, those design guidelines. Um, so we can, we have cross sections for streets um, that again are really, uh, are really conducive to uh, a wide variety of road users. Um, I, earlier today, I spoke with a group of a, a, a group uh, a, a, in Canada about street design, and I genuinely believe that this is an understudied and really important area that really dictates our entire public realm. Okay, so streets are one thing that can be developed uh, in zoning codes uh, because zoning codes are looked to when new subdivisions are developed. So even though you might think, well, why are streets a zoning issue? Um, it, they can be a zoning issue uh, where subdivisions are an issue. The other big thing that we did uh, in Hartford through our zoning code was eliminating minimum parking requirements. Uh, we're the first city to do that. Buffalo did that for um, uses of 5,000 square feet or less, but we, we were the first city to completely eliminate them citywide, except for uh, commercial car sales lots for obvious reasons. You need the cars to be located on the lot, but that's not really a parking requirement in the same sense. Um, so, so the reason that we did that is because cars are really detrimental to quality of life. The more parking you require, studies have shown, the more people will drive. If you don't require so much parking, you're not creating, the, you're not mandating that property owners create infrastructure for cars. If you create infrastructure for cars, cars will use it. Um, so the question for us was, are we, we have tons of surface parking lots. I know you've heard from Norman, Norman Garrick in the past. We have tons of surface parking lots all over Hartford. Uh, our zoning code upends that. This is my, if you remember nothing about my presentation today, um, this is the thing I want you to remember most. I believe that eliminating minimum parking requirements is the single most important thing we had done in our zoning code. The reason is, is that, you know, the, not only for quality of life, greenhouse gas emissions, asthma, and so on, but it, it parking requirements constrain the amount of land that can be developed for uses other than surface parking. So if you want development to happen in your city, you will eliminate parking. Not to say that you can't manage parking through on-street residential permits, uh, shared parking lots and so on, but you're not requiring property owners to build it on the lot in crazy amounts um, that we have in modern codes. So this is the only thing I really want you to remember, um, if nothing else. Instead of minimum parking requirements, on the left we have minimum bicycle parking requirements, and those have been used and they have started to really create a nice uh, set of, of bike uh, infrastructure. The middle image is our purple transit-oriented development zone. This zone uh, enables the same kinds of development along the Connecticut Fast Track as, as is allowed downtown. Um, so we're hoping, uh, so th this is a lot, a parking lot that's used at, in the transit-oriented development zone. Um, where we've seen some new uh, activity, and I'd love to see activity in a parking lot. All right, in the waste, uh, we have allowed composting anywhere, everywhere. We have specific rules on that. We've banned uh, a number of things, fracking, uh, new landfills. Um, we have a landfill, uh, new, new uh, scrap yards. Um, so we have those kinds of facilities in Hartford. On the right, you see the old code, uh, the river on the right, uh, where we stupidly zoned uh, the pink is all industrial uses. And uh, we've rezoned our river to allow for, um, for a Connecticut river overlay. But we know that because of the infrastructure that's already on the river, the industrial infrastructure, that'll take uh, generations to change. But the Connecticut River overlay allows for sustainable mixed use development along the river when that does ultimately change. In the area of water, zoning has a big role to play in ensuring water quality, minimum parking requirements, and narrower roads will reduce stormwater runoff, period. Um, green infrastructure is something else that we've, uh, that we've uh, incorporated into codes uh, for properties that disturb over a certain amount of square feet. 
Uh, they either have to incorporate a green infrastructure, stormwater management, like this uh, rain garden that you see on the left, on site, or they have to pay into a stormwater infrastructure fund. Another important issue that can be addressed by zoning and you should address uh, as a city uh, is artificial turf. This is a stormwater uh, water quality issue, but it's also a huge public health issue. Our provisions on artificial turf are on the right. Uh, we allow for cork, coconut, rice, silica sand, um, but we don't allow for any uh, synthetic infill, including crumb rubber. I believe crown rubber is the asbestos of our time. And now I sound like a wild conspiracy theorist, but I really believe it. Um, you see uh, reports all over the country of soccer goalies and others who have uh, been um, used crown rubber fields getting very strange forms of cancer uh, because they inhale the dust that this crown rubber creates. They're also just a huge environmental hazard. All right, so all of these things uh, came together in our zoning code. I've talked about all of these things uh, already. Um, after we adopted the zoning code, we realized people wanted to do more than, uh, than we had done in zoning. So we, we can do a lot in zoning, but it's only prospective. Zoning only changes the city when uh, somebody comes in for a permit. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so we uh, developed, well, I think I have a slide on this in a moment, uh, a climate action plan. So let me just stick with the zoning code. Um, last thing, changing housing. So your ideas uh, embedded throughout your document, you talk about uh, two-family zoning, mixing uses, uh, home occupations. Um, certainly we did that. I'm not going to belabor this point uh, from the local level. We did rezonings from single family. Um, we've uh, uh, increased home occupations to include things like cottage food making. Um, we've legalized accessory dwelling units, which you should do also. Um, some cities are reluctant to do this, or they put a lot of constraints on accessory dwellings. But what you're really doing by blocking accessory dwellings, which are uh, small units of housing that can be incorporated into single family housing, uh, by blocking those, you are uh, in a city like Rochester, you are um, take, you are preventing black and Latino homeowners and urban homeowners in general uh, from capitalizing on their home ownership investment. I guarantee you that suburbs around Rochester are permissive as to ADUs. Um, and I would encourage you to com compare that to Rochester. So reform on housing raises property values. And by reform, I really mean providing alternatives to single family housing. Accessory dwelling units help homeowners stay in place. Um, Multifamily housing, including two, three, four family housing raises uh, the uh, property values of surrounding homes. On the note of housing, I do want you to, to point, uh, to go to check out this website, um, desegregatect.org on Twitter at Desegregate Connecticut. I'm on Twitter at Sarah Bronin, um, if you wanna engage with me there. Um, we find that, um, so, so Desegregate Connecticut is, is an effort that emerged in June of last year, and it is a statewide effort on, on housing reform. And I point you to this page, uh, which we have a huge coalition, by the way, of 60 something organizations that includes architects, planners, um, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, some municipal organizations and more. We have active um, legislation uh, that will be considered. The imperative to consider housing reform is really a, a critical issue nationally. There's a page on our website uh, called Why Act, and, and that's a page if you ever hear opponents to housing reform, um, you can visit that page and our FAQs page and uh, arm yourself with that. What our group has found is that statewide, uh, the whole state is zoned uh, for single family housing. That's purple, 90.5% of land in Connecticut. This is where four family housing is allowed by contrast as of right. So we see huge income disparities in Connecticut and I believe you do also in the Rochester region. Um, so I just encourage you to, to, to think about uh, some of the things that I'm, I'm mentioning. So one of our statewide proposals, we've legalized it in Hartford, legalizing accessory dwelling units uh, statewide. There's lots of conditions that towns impose on those, including that they be detached, that they ban renters and so on. Um, but we think that that uh, is not something that uh, should continue. We're also proposing uh, transit-oriented development statewide. So all of these communities, and that's Connecticut, if you don't recognize the shape of it, all the purple communities are uh, communities with train stations. Um, we're suggesting in a half mile radius around those stations that uh, development be allowed as of right, getting back to that 
for, for up to four fam for four family or more housing. Similarly, we're proposing for Main Streets um, that around um, a, a commercial corridor for 7,500 people or more, um, that they allow two to four family housing. And this reinforces what Rochester you know, is suggesting. Re mixed use reinforces actually the, the, the vitality of small businesses because it puts feet on the street. All right, so back to Hartford. Our zoning code was adopted unanimously in one night. It's won a lot of awards and praise. Um, nice press for Hartford. You could see on the top left, by the way, all the surface parking even in and around our downtown, which we hope uh, will one day, uh, we were actually on a really nice upswing until uh, COVID hit, uh, but we hope one day we can uh, keep that activity. Uh, we've seen lots of development under the code, um, a new soccer stadium, uh, redevelopment of Cape Well uh, on the top left and 777 Main Street on the top right. Um, the bottom right uh, is that Willow, is a Willow Creek development, uh, one of the developments that has been uh, built in Hartford with new streets that satisfy our street provisions. There's other provisions in our code about craftsman industrial uses, um, so uses that allow for people to make up to 20,000 square feet, uh, uh, make stuff, uh, for lack of a better word, and even live there. Another outgrowth of our, our zoning code has been the Climate Action Plan, which is uh, our focus has been public health, economic development, and social equity. And that, again, grew out of all that we heard during the zoning code process about climate issues. And we've hoped to continue on that path, although there's a lot more we can do. We we're actually one of the first Soul Smart Gold cities because of our solar policies, along with Austin, Texas. So that's not too bad. So if we can do it here, you guys can definitely do it in Rochester. And I'm going to stop there and I see a robust amount of questions. Uh, so I will actually stop sharing and try to take those. So Marie, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, that was a great presentation. And uh, we do have many, many, many questions. I do wanna just tell you all that there will be a recording of uh, this presentation provided to all of the attendees and it will be put in our website and YouTube channel for other people who might not have been able to attend. So the other issue is that many of you may need to drop off at one o'clock. Um, so fear not, you will have access to the entirety of the program uh, as it's being recorded. Uh, with that, we're gonna get into some questions and um, let's, uh, Let's see what we have. I know I noticed one of the most important uh, similarities is the riverfront. And uh, so that beautiful park that you have on your riverfront. And uh, I noticed uh, as you were talking about the zoning, the, the overlay district. So we obviously have a similar situation with industrial uses lining our river and how we're going to you know, look towards converting that. I believe I shared with you our Rock the Riverway uh, plan that was uh, a concept that's being developed to help in, uh, inspire development along the river. But how, how was that accomplished in Hartford? Uh, how long did it take? Obviously, these types of projects have a long timeline, um, but obviously you're enjoying the success of, of that process. So the, the actual rezoning, um, the, the um, Code of Metrics and, and Fitzgerald Halliday were hired, I believe, in um, 2014, but they really did a lot of work uh, behind the scenes that year um, to, 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 to document uh, the building types in Hartford and to do a full diagnostic survey. Uh, we, we started meeting, I started meeting with people at the end of that year and through, um, through 2015. Um, I'm like trying to think back, what is, what is the timeline? We adopted the code in January 2016. Um, and so we had obviously gone through the process, um, you know, before the before, uh, so it was adopted in 2016, but the bulk of the work took place in 2015. Um, and again, you know, we adopted it in, in one night in part because of all that consulting that we had done and the fact that um, uh, really the interests of people from across the community were represented. Great. Um, we obviously have a, a diverse uh, group of people participating and attending and, and some are more knowledgeable about processes than others. But we have a question here that states, in New York State actions that are subject to our little NEPA, um, the, the State Environmental Quality Review Act, Seeker, 
require use of discretion. Permitted uses by right are typically ministerial and exempt from seeker. Are the circumstances similar uh, in Connecticut in that uh, did you lose some ability to impose some environmental standards? So I don't know if it's different in, in New York State, but our uh, SEPA, our, our State Environmental Policy Review Act applies to state projects. State projects are not subject to zoning. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's some projects in New York State that are subject. Uh, actually, there, there are. Um, I actually know uh, there's a, a a case that I um, that I that we have in, in our historic preservation law textbook actually that now that I'm thinking about it from New York State um, involving a, a tower that was going up in the uh, Chinatown neighborhood of Manhattan. Okay, so you do have uh, a little state statute that, that applies to private actions, um, a little SEPA is what they call it. Um, so uh, that was not a problem that we have here because it, or not an issue that we raised here because we don't have that kind of review over over private actions. That said, though, um, I, I think your your law focus, if I'm remembering the case correctly, I think your law focuses on the impact or potential impact. I'm not sure whether it would, um, I'm not sure how, you know, the zone, zoning uh, processes um, re relate to uh, relate to that. If, if the in other words, if the process is as important as the impact, but I'd, I'll have to look into that just out of curiosity. Great, thank you. I know that we had a lot of questions that are being comments and questions put in the chat, so please uh, add them in the question Q and A button so that I can see them and, and pass them on. Um, we have Dwayne Feller who says, "I fully agree with the need for and value of comprehensive zoning overhaul." However, it is important that we do not overstate its impact on equity. Interesting. Rochester has lost tens of thousands of jobs in the city and most new job growth is in the outer suburbs. We have plenty of room in our industrial zones and our downtown to bring in new jobs without, excuse me, just lost that question. Uh, bring in new jobs without the need for any zoning changes. A major factor limiting job growth downtown is the dependence on parking that is a result of our weak transit ser service. The big issue in a non-affluent parts of the city is the need to deliberately incentivize new employers to locate here. Zoning reforms may help to squeeze in more development in areas that are already doing well, but is that, but that is not really equity. Do you agree that we need to address issues such as improving transit before we can make major headway with equity? Long comment. Um, yeah, I'm not I, entirely sure what how you feel about the, the the sense about the relationship between equity and transit and zoning. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, transit is an is an is an is a it's a fundamentally an equity problem. Um, it the, our transit system prioritizes the people who can afford cars. That's the bottom line. My point is that zoning reform uh, will help that that current zoning also prioritizes people who have cars. So when you talk about, oh, our downtown is, is dependent on parking, um, it, it's dependent on parking because downtown provides lots of parking options. I assume that you have as many parking uh, places as, as Hartford does. People always think of, you know, there's a, there's a parking shortage, uh, but there's never a parking shortage. The parking shortage is always balanced with the market demand for parking. So if there's a fewer parking spaces than people demand, which I suspect is not the case in Rochester, it's certainly not the case in Hartford, uh, prices will go up. And those people who, uh, who decide, well, well, I'm not going to drive, will start taking the bus into Hartford, which, by the way, there are plenty of buses from the outlying suburbs that go, to Hart that go into downtown. And make make investment in buses more politically uh, feasible. Um, so I, I guess I, I see. Sure, yes, we should improve the transportation system, but zoning plays a really important role in locking in inequitable outcomes the way it is now. Um, and I don't think it's uh, a, a, a correct to say, well, two two areas of our city can solve this issue. I think that taking a good look at, at all parts of the city is something that's really important because all parts of the city are really interlinked. And if you wanna achieve the things that, that the city plan says, you, you, you can't just rely on a couple of neighborhoods to do it. That's yeah. my take. I know that in, um, in Rochester, uh, we are very auto dependent, partly because there are limited options and certainly we are addressing those issues 
the public transit service locally has revamped their system the first time it's been uh, re reworked in 50 years and hopefully the implementation was stalled by the pandemic, but hopefully coming next year, we start to see uh, access to some other options that will help us to start to understand the, the, this change that we can make with our, with our roadways. Um, certainly the pandemic has shown us that we have many better options for using uh, many of our, our public spaces and, uh, and roads. So hopefully we can take that with us as we, as we grow. Um, one, one very interesting comment was um, about ADUs, and uh, we have a question here. Does suburban and village zoning codes around Rochester are not ADU friendly? Many villages have a legacy of larger older homes that have been divided into many apartments that landowners don't maintain and become a nuisance. Often they want to undo any of those provisions that are in the codes. Uh, that makes it for a hard sell to allow ADUs. So this is in reference to, uh, for a period of time, there, there had been a mm -hmm. uh, kind of an interest in downsizing multifamily housing, you know, reconverting housing back to single family units in some uh, urban neighborhoods. But the question also is about the lack of interest or desire to allow for ADUs as, as you've proposed. So talk to a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit more about how you see not putting uh, any uh, barriers to ADUs, how, how that benefits the community. Yeah, so I, I put a link in the chat to a, a, a page on our statewide zoning reform effort page on ADUs. It has a link to a few, uh, a few studies that are specific to ADUs. Um, an ADU is not the scenario uh, that's outlined in the question, which is uh, one house being chopped up into multiple apartments. It is a, a situation where you have a principal dwelling, which is the larger dwelling, and a smaller unit that is on the third floor in a basement, in a carriage house, second floor, or you know, or one of one of those, or maybe in some part of the house that's that's um, distinct from the from the principal dwelling in some other way, but but. ADUs are, are small units that are built on the same lot as a single family dwelling, not, uh, not a bunch of apartments. Um, you know, if you look at the demographics of this country, we do not uh, appear to be moving in a direction where more people want single family housing. We appear to be moving in a direction where more people want housing options. Um, we also see, so, so an ADU is something that provides people with options. We also see that there's a huge burden of home on homeowners and home ownership, and allowing ADUs is a way to help people with mortgages, uh, with home, home, you know, home costs, uh, actually be able to afford living in, uh, in their home. In Connecticut, one in six families is cost burdened, severely cost burdened, meaning they spend over 50% of their income on housing. I'm sure the statistics are same in New York, and that. Uh, goes for homeowners as well. So that that's a really, um, I think ADUs are, uh, you know, maybe it's it's unpopular in your region, but but we've gotten, um, you know, endorsements from all of those coalition members uh, that I mentioned to that legalizing ADUs uh, without, with maybe just an owner occupancy uh, limit is really the only substantive uh, limitation um, that would be uh, available to towns, but, but legalizing them is, is something that we feel like it needs to happen. And uh, kind of related to that question, I recently came across some comments regarding ACU, so accessory commercial units. Uh, do you have any experience with, with those and, and how they might be, uh, how they might contribute to a community's uh, well-being? Yeah, we, we, I mean, the way that we handle mixed uses, of course, we allow um, uh, in, in areas other than the areas that are predominantly residential, we allow for um, mixes of various kinds of uses, uh, residential above, uh, every main street. Um, so, but, but thinking about an accessory commercial unit to a, to a primary residential use, you know, we, we've, we've loosened a bit our home occupations, but we haven't done what I think uh, is being popularized as a, a, the term uh, accessory commercial uh, unit beyond those couple of things, home occupations. The craftsman industrial uses where those are allowed, um, but we haven't done that yet in Hartford. So I'd be interested if you guys do that to uh, to come send that uh, experience back our way. Well, this ADU seemed to be a very popular uh, 
topic here. So we, we have another question. Um, and it relates mostly to this, uh, this idea of absentee landlords. So what are, is it a requirement for ADUs to be allowed that the house be owner occupied? Because uh, one, one of the questions here is, you know, we have a problem with absentee landlords that provide substandard housing. How do we prevent that with ADUs? So is it their requirement that ADUs are only allowed for people that uh, occupy the premises? Um, I actually can't remember. <laughs> I'm going to scroll through my zoning code uh, right now. We changed it recently. Um, hold on, let me. See. It's in three five somewhere. Uh, we changed it recently. Uh, the vast majority of um, of uh, so in studying so the, this zoning atlas, if you haven't seen it uh, on the Desegregate Connecticut website, is it has all of the. I could probably just flip there faster. Um, but it has all of the ways that um, property, that cities limit accessory dwelling units. Um, so you can see that owner occupancy is actually one uh, that is uh, pretty prevalent. No, I don't think we do. I think we, property owners, I don't think we do. I, I can't, I'll look on the zoning atlas too, but that's a great question. So we uh, kind of along the same thread about uh, densifying neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, William Collins states, a, a lot of neighborhood resistance, there is a lot of neighborhood resistance to allowing more rental units. Uh, is the possibility of out of town investors owning the property and neglecting it? Do, uh, does Hartford address that issue with its zoning? Yeah, so through zoning, and by the way, yes, I, I just looked at the atlas and we, we had um, originally had some provisions for owner occupancy requirements for ADUs and, and we don't have those anymore in, in, um, in Hartford. Uh, the question about absentee home ownership, that's not something that uh, absentee ownership, it's not something that's typically addressed through, um, through zoning except through home ownership provisions, but mm -hmm. there's so many other kinds of, um, uh, so many owner occupancy type provisions, um, but there's so many other kinds of, uh, strategies that local governments can use to address absentee uh, absentee owners, blight ordinances, and, and things like that. We mm -hmm. do have some of those here. Um, it's obviously a, an ongoing issue, though, uh, with housing code inspectors, with our blight enforcement office, and so on when it comes to housing. Mm -hmm. So we have a few comments regarding uh, gentrification. So um, was uh, was this a concern in Hartford and what has been done to imp uh, has been the impact of their zoning code update on gentrification? So gentrification is about displacement of people um, and uh, people are displaced when there is a high demand on land. Um, people are also displaced when uh, when rents become so high they can no longer afford to live in neighborhoods. In Hartford, we, we see that uh, there's so much land, vacant land and uh, potential conversions of property to residential use that we don't, we have not experienced uh, that phenomenon uh, in any scale. If you look at our, even uh, there's, there's been hundreds of apartment units that have been added uh, to downtown, for example, over the last five years. Uh, those have been fully occupied, 98% occupancy throughout downtown. Um, and, and for whatever reason, they tend to be occupied by people who are coming in from other areas to live in Hartford. Um, but and, but that, those have not uh, affected the rent of neighboring areas. If anything, studies have shown that in areas with low housing supply, when you create more housing, it actually reduces prices um, uh, on the whole, there's a great study um, that I can throw in the chat from the Furman Center in, in uh, at New York City. Um, and what they've done is, is shown that, so they, they, the study is called, um, uh, I can't remember, it has a really clever name uh, uh, about, uh, it's called supply skepticism. That's what it's called. The people are very skeptical about the fact that supply has a positive effect on housing prices. Um, but in fact, it does. So I encourage you to read that study to learn more about how creating more diverse and abundant housing actually uh, prevents gentrification. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question by Richard Glazer. He says, uh, Rochester has workers uh, 
and employment, but many commuters, even teachers and um, emergency um, personnel live predominantly in the burbs. Does Hartford face similar disinvestment as there is very affluent suburb there too? I would like you to address the tensions between the burbs and the city and how people in the burbs seem to have strong opinions about the city that cater to their car centric lifestyle. Yeah, so we recognize that Hartford is part of a broader region and in fact, one of the wealthiest regions in the country, our suburbs, uh, despite the fact that Hartford has uh, uh, endemic poverty. Um, so we, we see some of that tension here. Um, part of what we've been trying to do though is to, to use through political rhetoric, through uh, our planning processes and otherwise to engage those uh, people who are out of town but nonetheless have a stake in Hartford to really see us as one region. There's a big uh, planning effort underway uh, for the region now. It's called Hartford 400. Uh, it, and uh, it's sort of developing, it's stopped short a little by COVID. But our city plan uh, is the first city plan, it was just completed last year, uh, to be adopted as part of the Hartford 400 framework. So we are feeding into this regional framework and other towns are doing the same thing as they're doing their city plans, or at least we hope they will. Um, so that that is really part of that is a political narrative about what Hartford is and what Rochester is and how we contribute to the surrounding communities and, and why we need to act as a region. Um, zoning can't, uh, can't um, solve that problem. Get into a few easier questions. Uh, Steve Smith wonders, uh, he thought he heard you say that Hartford has a maximum building height. And if so, why is that? So in our form-based code, we set out height parameters for every type of building. So for example, that house type B is between two and three stories. The reason for that is that we want to encourage new development by enabling it and setting out clear guidelines for it, as you saw in that code. But we also want it to be compatible with existing neighborhoods. Um, so that that's so where we are now is we're starting off with this process. People didn't want to get too wild, um, you know, with our first form-based code. And I think from what I've seen, it's working really well. The height, the height is, has not been an issue. Um, we, we allow lots of height in uh, big swaths of the city, like the transit-oriented development areas, certain institutional areas in downtown. Um, but it, again, it hasn't been uh, a big issue on the height. Yeah, I noticed your, your downtown seems to have, you know, many tall buildings, uh, probably a little bit. 38 stories, yeah. Yeah, probably maybe a f more than we do here, but um, for your transit-oriented development, I'm curious, what is the height um, recommendation or limitation? Um, the, and I'll, I'll, I believe it's the same as downtown, uh, downtown three. You guys are quizzing me really, really well on, the, on these. I, I stepped down as a zoning, uh, zoning commission chair uh, a couple of, uh, a few months, well, maybe last spring. Um, so I haven't been in my code so much. So yes, so it's the downtown three, it, it's whatever's allowed in downtown three. So that's up to eight stories and additional six stories for bonuses. And I believe that when that area starts getting developed, you will see buildings up to 14 stories in that area because th that park field where I showed you that parking lot market um, is one of those areas where I think it will, we will be seeing new construction once the uh, pandemic lifts. Okay. Now, kind of relative to the density and height question, um, is there anything in your code that uh, addresses incremental development? Because we, we see kind of the natural way that uh, development occurs sometimes is this idea that, you know, you build something that's four stories and then it gets knocked down and that becomes eight. And But is, is there anything in your code that uh, addresses incremental development and that might require someone to allow for a certain number of stories, even though they don't fully build out? Well, I think the code is, anticipates that there will be a range of building heights that will happen. So for example, in the downtown, it's between three and eight in that downtown three district. In the more concentrated downtown district, it's up to 38 stories to match uh, city place, but it's, I think, as low as four. So, you know, we, we do uh, anticipate a, a big range um, within what we've approved already in terms of height. So Dan Gladding asks uh, a more general question. Can you focus on a few key ways that the zoning code can address and support equity? 
and then contrast it with the ways that zoning code can obstruct equity. So can you provide you know, maybe some clear examples of, of each of those? Yeah, so I don't know if if, um, if that question came in before my presentation, but I was hoping that my presentation would illustrate uh, some specifics. But, you know, again, for me, the, the top ways are eliminating minimum parking requirements, uh, diversifying, diversifying buying housing. And, and you know, you're, in, in your plan, it talks about legalizing two families, uh, maybe citywide. Um, you know, I, I suggest accessory dwelling units as an alternative or in addition to that. Um, so, uh, so housing, and then I do think all of the specific things on sustainability are, are they're fundamentally equity, uh, equity moves, uh, because if you don't have a healthy city with clear water and nice air and fewer cars, um, people are not, are not healthy and, and that, and, and they, they bear the brunt of all of those commuters coming in and they, they don't have anything, um, that will help them, you know, clean trees, you know, all of that is all intertwined. So. Um, but there's, I, what I tried to do is provide a menu. Um, how zoning obstructs equity, I, 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 for a city like, post-industrial city like Rochester, much like Hartford, uh, the onerous um, review processes that come in public hearing requirements and uh, the constraints on um, development that, that the community wants, um, and you know they want it because they've told you in the city plan that they want that kind of development. Z zoning that constrains the kind of development that people want and believe will provide opportunities for their neighborhood. Any barrier that zoning creates um, to that is is uh, is inequitable. So um, you know it's it's hard to pinpoint one thing. So some of us um, that have a better understanding of farm based code kind of understand that flexibility is, is, is built into farm-based farm codes. But uh, we, we have a question here um, that how easy is it to build something that does not conform to the farm-based guidelines and how much citizen input is involved in getting waivers or exemptions of the code? So we know commonly it's, it's very typical for people to apply for uh, variances and exceptions to our code now as it is now. Uh, is that a typical issue with farm-based codes? Yeah, so, so if you want to deviate from the provisions of any zoning code, you go to the board that issue, issues variances. It might be called the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Zoning Board of Adjustment in Rochester, I'm not sure. Um, it's usually either one of those. Um, and it's the variance process where often neighbors are notified and there's a public hearing and the property owner says why they think they have a hardship. Now, legally, we see a lot of situations where people say they have hardships, but or they don't even address the issue of hardship and yet their variance is approved. Um, following the legal requirements for hardship is often very difficult for lay boards. Um, so we, you know, that, that it's sort of luck of the draw depending on how your board uh, is, is constituted. Um, in, in Connecticut, we can actually regulate the kinds of things that the Zoning Board of Appeals may not vary from. Um, so we have a number of things in our code that actually uh, prohibit uh, the zoning board from hearing variances on because we feel so strongly that those kinds of uses should never be allowed in, in certain neighborhoods. Thank you, Sarah. There is, um, I'm trying to get to most people's questions, so please bear with me. I, I try to scan them and, and try to group them into categories, but um, we have a, a question from Lisa Reagan regarding um, low-income seniors in Monroe County. And it's a long question, but uh, the statement is seniors do not want to live in high rises if they have a choice. They want to live near amenities uh, and families so that they're not isolated and feel safe. These factors allow people to age in place. How does the upzoning of housing in single and double uh, multifamily housing to promote diversity proposals support these needs? Yeah, so I mean, how, how it, does it, the AARP has just released a, a bunch of uh, reports and I guess, opinion documents about the need for like accessory dwelling units specifically and also for more diverse housing. And you're right, not, not everybody wants to live in a high rise. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, from the state, zooming to the statewide zoning effort that I'm working on now, that we've uh, looked at, at single family, at, um, at a two to four unit housing and, and putting that housing near main streets where seniors can actually walk to stuff they might want to see. Um, and creating in communities with single family housing only 
opportunities for people who want to downsize from their single family home to stay in their community. Uh, it's cheaper on average uh, to live in a two to four unit dwelling than a single family dwelling. Um, it's also, uh, you have a little bit more of a sense of, of neighborhoods which seniors are seeking. And again, the AARP is all of all of you. Yeah, and we know that aging in place is, is uh, an issue that's really being, uh, that is quite of interest right now. Um, so here's a question regarding our streets by uh, Kevin Kelly. Our fire department insists on streets wide enough to accommodate their enormous vehicles, which works against our pedestrian prioritization and road diet objectives. Uh, did Hartford have to grapple with this issue? Yeah, and I put Kevin a, a, a link to another paper that I just um, uh, drafted called Rules of the Road, which is this paper on street design and vehicle design, um, but, but focusing on the, on the issue of streets. And I talk about fire codes in the paper because fire codes, so at California has an example uh, code, um, and it may be the case in New York State too, because these are common from state to state, but uh, a, a road will has to be 40 feet wide um, uh, so that a fire truck can safely get down and if people are, are parked on both sides, um, according to the fire code. And from a road safety perspective, that's absolutely crazy um, because that means that you have these extremely wide travel lanes. It also means that uh, pedestrians can't cross the street without having to walk for a very long time. It's a matter of fractions of a second's uh, difference, but it's still really important. Um, Any time a pedestrian is in the street, bed, um, it's not safe. So uh, the, the narrower you make roads, the safer it is. So I encourage you to check out that paper. Thank you. And so here's a question by an anonymous, anonymous attendee said, um, you said multifamily increases property values. As planners, we often hear the opposite cry from residents. Do you have a source to uh, to use to document this statement. Yes. So how? Yeah, I just put it in. That put our so desegregate Connecticut has an FAQs and one of the page and one of them is, um, you know, concerns about my property values. If you click on that, there's links to a bunch of surveys. Steady so. Do you have? Um, we know there's a lot of interest currently with the idea of building 15 minute neighborhoods, 15 minute communities, 15 minute city. So. Uh, obviously, we know that all of these things, walkability, uh, multi-use, uh, allowing ADUs and ACUs helps to contribute to creating diverse options and communities. Do you, um, do you see any organized movements towards this in specific areas around Hartford or is it just happening organically? I mean, so the 15 minute uh, city is, a, you know, it's something that people throw out there. Uh, most of our communities around Hartford will not ha be 15 minute cities just by the way that they're developed. They're, they have one main street and they have a, then a lot of uh, residential land around them, our 15 minute towns anyway. Um, Hartford already is. I'm sure Rochester is too. We have tons of neighborhood commercial corridors, small blocks and houses that are somewhat close together. So for, in terms of the amenities that we mostly have within a 15 minute rate, uh, walk radius of any residential uh, area in Hartford, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we, older cities are built to be 15 minute cities. We just have to let them be 15 minute cities. I, I agree with you. Um, here's an interesting question. Does your code allow for tiny homes? It, it, that's a good, so it, it allows for accessory dwelling units uh, that would meet that criteria, but uh, we don't really have, we have another, um, what's the name of it? We, 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 we don't really have a lot of that because of the form-based code uh, provision. Um, so I'd be, we allow for um, that one of our residential building types to be arranged in a cottage cluster, um, but and and that could provide the flexibility for the a form based uh, for a a, um, a a tiny home type uh, cluster development. But beyond that, we don't really have good regulations for that. Um, Kim Peer asks, through the code, how have you encouraged or required green space? 
So I mentioned the tree canopy coverage requirements. Um, the fact that we don't have uh, minimum parking means that we don't have the, we can impose higher, um, higher caps on building coverage, which uh, we do in the code. Um, we also, by the way, have a maximum number of parking uh, cap. So we don't have a minimum, but, but if somebody wants to put max, put max out their lot and cover it with parking, we say you can't do that um, because we have these maximum parking requirements. So that again, parking has a tie to the amount of green space that that you can that you can have. Um, Bill Price asks, do you agree that single family housing costs more in services than it generates in tax revenue? I don't have to agree, that's a fact. <laughs> I mean, I it's just, a fact, that's, that's a, so if you think about it, for, if you have single family housing that, that's built out, you have to build longer roads to get to the same unit that you would if you have a compact development. Right, I, I knew the answer to that. I just wanted you to say it. <laughs> um, Tim Raymond asks, does the Hartford code ban or otherwise address drive-throughs? A yes. sustainable city that does yes, not do. cater to cars should ban them. Yes, we do. We, we ban drive-throughs. In fact, we got, that was a, that, we haven't gotten sued for this code, but this one time, and it was from a person who wanted to build a McDonald's to operate on, um, uh, to, to operate in, in a lot where uh, really there's no, 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 but before we changed the code, uh, they would have been allowed to have a drive through. Uh, but one of the reasons that we did this widespread effort and changed the code universally, universally is to ban drive throughs anywhere, they're anywhere near uh, neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods. And the reason is because of idling, it's because of, um, you know, everything, everything that you, every bad, you know, thing that comes from fast food that you can see from a planning perspective, uh, we heard people did not want. And so we zone those out. There are some zones uh, in and around the high, basically anywhere we allow a gas station, which is in and around uh, highway exits and things like that, you can have a drive through, but anywhere else you cannot. Okay. Claire Doyle Dowd asks, does it appear that the new zoning code has been a hook or a marketing tool for developers to consider Hartford to be a good place to consider new projects? Interesting yes. approach. Yeah, you know, it has because, you know, as I mentioned those awards and that recognition that we got because that, you know, we, we people knew about our code or we applied for those awards. And the only reason, you know, we don't need awards. The only reason to apply for and, and go out and like show people what we've done is because if people know what we've done and they see it's part of a coherent vision for the city, they're a lot more likely to be interested in developing here. And that's really the goal. Hartford has lost population uh, uh, over the last hundred years. Its peak population was 180,000. It's 125,000 now. We see vacant lots and, and um, you know, vacant properties all over the city. And we have to reverse that. We have to gain population if we're gonna succeed as a city and if our region is gonna succeed. So the publicity that comes with a rezoning that uh, you know, is like ours, which is huge community development, uh, huge community engagement, um, you know, lots of uh, support from lots of different people and people here understanding that zoning is part of the solution. Um, you know, all of that is really important to creating a, um, a different view of Hartford to say, look, we're innovative, we're working, we're trying to be more sustainable, we're trying to be more equitable. And even though it'll take lots of time for it to manifest in the city, the zoning code is an important part of that. Someone who is a little bit more familiar with Hartford asks, uh, Ellen Oberst says, when the Northeast Corridor is upgraded to real high-speed rail, how do you expect that to affect Hartford? Do you expect it to have, uh, do you expect to have to adapt your zoning to accommodate more density in that particular area? Um, so where we have plans already to, as to where, because we, we actually can't accommodate high-speed rail in Hartford where our historic train station is now. So we have plans to move that train station to another part of the city. Just checking out our zoning map, um, where that part, where that will occur um, already is zoned for pretty dense development. Um, we can, we would, I would assume that future zoning regulators will expand the downtown zone to include also the area all around. It's, it's close to downtown we, where we hope the new train station will go. Um, and by the way, we are banking on this high speed rail. We're all in. Um, my husband happens to be the mayor of Hartford. 
Um, and, it, and I was appointed to the zoning code before he, and I did the zoning code overhaul with our team um, before he got here, but, uh, but he's the mayor of Harvard and he's co-chairing the Northeast Corridor effort um, because it's so important to our city to, to, to have those kinds of connections for so many different reasons. Uh, but zoning, I, I mean, I assume that zoning regulators will, when that's located, uh, adapt the downtown district uh, to that and extend it a little bit more. Great. And we, we have uh, interesting drive-throughs are a, a big topic of interest. So uh, Doreen Kirkmeyer wants to know if there have been many variance applications that allow for drive-throughs. They're think just not allowed. I, I don't, I think that's one of the variances that we don't allow. Okay. So it's, uh, you, you've decided on places where you need to take a hard line and, uh, and that takes care of that. So that's good to hear. Um, how have you handled curbside pickup with COVID, which is now a, a form of drive-through? It's, it's, you know, it's a temporary thing and it's not really, so by drive-through, you really, it's a built form. So it's a form with a, you know, a, an awning and a window and a, you know, a, and it, a driveway it, cut. Yeah. And it's a different driveway. I mean, a curbside pickup is you, you can go up to the entrance, somebody walks it out and you, and you carry on, you sit in a parking lot and you do it. So I, I don't see that that's going to be that's a big long-term issue. Okay. So Kim Russell, uh, Kim Peer Russell wants to know uh, what suggestions you might have to conduct community engagement that isn't just uh, superficial, that isn't just checking the boxes. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, you have to go do it. You have to go to people's meetings. You have to go into their houses. You have to go, um, across the city, I, you know, for me, I went to meetings all over the city in all kinds of settings. I didn't announce a meeting. You know, we, we had three public meetings where we announced it and said, everybody come to this one location. That, that's not engagement um, in any real way. You know, put sticky notes up and come to the central place. I personally went to all the community groups and said, I'm available. And then if they didn't respond, uh, no, I'm really available. Zoning really affects you. You know, you, you like, let me come to your meeting and talk about zoning. Um, I think they thought I was nuts, but, but on the other hand, if people don't understand, lots of people don't understand, even people who, who work as architects and planners, you know, sometimes don't even, uh, are, you know, not planners, maybe, you know, even architects, because I'm an architect, I'll say, you know, for us, we don't necessarily even understand all the things that zoning can do, you know, much less the average community organization. So why are they going to show up at your meeting if you haven't even told them what zoning does that's relevant to them? So I, I really think that the, the people who are leading zoning commissions have a responsibility to be out there and not just say, I'll be sitting here at this place so you can come talk to me. No, you have to go out to them and explain to them what the issue is. Yeah, we're, we're finding that there certainly does need to be an extensive education uh, in, in the community because very few people really understand how they're impacted by, by zoning. Um, there's a question here about how has the presence of colleges and universities impacted housing in Hartford? Um, you know, certainly it, where colleges don't have uh, housing on their campuses, you, know, you have college students living off campus. Our law school, for example, does not have um, does not have uh, house, uh, housing on its campus. Our law students typically live in um, the third floors and garage apartments of people in the neighborhood, which by the way, again, were illegal before we changed them. Um, the, the housing units um, were, were not uh, legal uh, before we changed the, the zoning rules. So, uh, you know, people, college students are, are great for um, testing boundaries and creating new unit types within communities, um, you know, le legal or not. Um, obviously, they sometimes present issues when you have uh, a bunch of college students in a house that are uh, operating, you know, in a frat house type uh, setting. But we haven't seen uh, too much of that here in terms of conflicts with uh, neighbors. We do have three uh, major colleges, University of Hartford, Trinity College, um, and uh, Saint Saint jo well Saint Joseph's on the other side of the uh, other side of the border, but um, has a, has a um, one of its schools downtown, uh, and the law school, of course, UConn Law School where I teach. So, um, so we have a few places where that might be problematic, but that they haven't really been a huge zoning problem here. We're not a college town like some some towns would be. 
I know we have uh, in Rochester, we have a significant number of uh, colleges and universities uh, nearby, uh, some urban campuses, but mostly on the periphery. Um, there's a, a question regarding the removal of parking requirements. How do you balance the impact of off-site parking in residential districts um, and, and neighborhood business districts that permit much needed local good services, goods and services? So the issue, the issue with parking, parking requirements is that they require the parking to be built on the same lot as the use. Zoning only affects the lot where the permit is uh, being requested. So when you have a minimum parking requirement, you're saying if you're operating a shop on Main Street X with an apartment upstairs, you have to build five parking spaces on your tiny little narrow lot. Well, how's that guy gonna do that? Or that gal gonna, gonna build that if you're on one of the typical lots that you see in Hartford or Rochester. Basically they have to build five units of parking behind their building and their building becomes this tiny little sliver of a building. By eliminating minimum parking requirements, you're telling to that property owner, you could build it on the lot up to our maximum, but better yet, why don't you work with building owners X, Y, and Z and go you know, develop a shared parking lot where people can park in a reasonable place uh, behind your building uh, or behind, you know, in that same block somewhere and maybe share the uses so that your residents when they come home at night are taking parking spots at office workers or whoever else takes during the day. Um, so you're yeah, letting yeah. the market get to some better solution than, um, than, uh, than, market distorting minimum parking requirements do. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there is a misconception when we talk about um, removing minimum parking requirements, that means that no parking is available, but that's that's not the case. There are other options and all you're doing is eliminating the requirement for people to have to provide a certain number of, of, of spaces. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, we, we have a question by Danny Bassett, and I think uh, we're getting near the end of our program. So uh, maybe one more question and we'll be, we'll be winding this up. Um, certain variances aren't allowed. This appears to be a conflict with the function of a zoning board. How does that work legally? I'm not sure if that's in reference to the drive-through yeah. or something else. Yeah, so, so legally, we, um, we uh, and state law in Connecticut allows for I bet it's the case in New York, uh, New York as well. Um, so, so Connecticut is the only state that empowers planning and zoning commissions to write rules. You do not have a situation in New York where your planning and zoning commission could adopt this law. Um, usually it's your city council, town council or whatever um, that actually adopts the zoning regulations. Because we are divorced from the political process in a way, um, we have these other powers, including the power to 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 uh, to uh, decide on the zoning board of appeals uh, purview. Um, so that's something that's written into our uh, city charter, as well. I believe if I remember the source of law correctly. So it may be something that your city council has the power to do. It may be something that's accounted for in state law or your city charter. Um, so the, the zoning regime in any state is what we make it. So the, 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 you know, we have some conceptual principles about what zoning is or should be, but the formal structures of that uh, are never set in stone. Um, in fact, we didn't have zoning when Rochester and Hartford first uh, developed. And uh, some could argue that without zoning, those cities developed even better uh, than they did with zoning. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the last uh, thing I'll leave you with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I encourage everyone to, um, to Follow those resources that Sarah provided. Certainly visit the Desegregate Connecticut website. It's uh, just chock full of fantastic information. I applaud the work that you're doing, Sarah, in Connecticut, and, and uh, we'll be following it closely to see how you're uh, able to, to knit this fabric of, of zoning together for the entire state. I know I have very dear friends in um, Westport, Connecticut, and I've been following some some of the case studies that uh, have come from areas like Westport. So uh, I wish you much success in your work. And I thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, thank you with very that, much. Um, you, Rochester. Monica is going to get back to our slides here. And we just want to remind you all that we are having a follow-up community conversation next Wednesday noon, same time, same place. Uh, we have the honor of having uh, Kevin Kelly, who's the Associate City Planner, and Jill Widrick, the Manager of Zoning, join us 
for an informal conversation. So we look forward to having you join us then. And coming up next, I believe, is our, our next presentation as the Reshaping Rochester series continues is Nidhi Gulati, who is the formal Senior Director of Programs and Projects at Projects for Public Spaces. She is, uh, as it says here, former, so she's no longer th with them, but she is joining us from France. So I'm sure she's going to have some great information to share about uh, equitable transit options. And lastly, we'd really appreciate you uh, taking the survey and helping us to uh, know what you'd like to see and hear from uh, the, the various topics or if you're familiar with any speakers. And obviously, please do not hesitate to reach out to either myself or to Monica uh, with your questions and comments. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>